Okay, we need red 30, green 32, and blue 23, which means we got to go down here, around, up, over, down, through, here, over, here, that. And then we have to go back over this way, down this way, over this way, up here. Oh my god. Why would they do this? What were they trying to prove? What were they trying to prove? Who were they trying to impress? Why? Okay, that, that was not as impressive as I was hoping it would be. Welcome back to another episode of our very special Crescent Hawks Inception playthrough. I'm your host, Gaming J, and you are joining us yet again to uh, carry forward on this intrepid adventure in the world of Battletech. I have just returned to the starport after adventuring in my last video to villages near and far. If we go to the overhead map, here's the starport. If we go down to the bottom right, so I'm go down and then to the left. We went to uh, this village here, and then further down, we came to this village, and then further west, we came to this village. We explored a bunch of villages, going back over here to use the starport. We also explored this jail over here, and we actually saved uh, another uh, Crescent Hawk operative, and also stole a mech. Uh, out of the impound lot, which was totally awesome. So we now have three mechs. We're back in the starport, however, because we have some unfinished business. In the last video, we earned some laser rifles, which I think are definitively worse than the Inferno rocket launchers we've been using. But whatever, if the uh, rocket launch, if the laser rifles suck, we'll just go ahead and buy some new rocket launchers. We are flush with cash after playing the stock market for uh, a couple of couple of videos. We now successfully have. $127,000 in stable investments, as well as $35,000 in our pockets. We are going to go ahead and ka-ching, ka-ching our way out. There's no way we need this much money, but uh, I'm going to take 100 and 2,840 out. So we're going to leave 25,000 permanently invested. Um, today in the starport, we want to get in some fights to try out our laser rifles. We also are going to try our hand at stealing a mech from the arena. I've never done this before, so I don't quite know how to do it. So if I can even figure it out, we'll give it a shot. Um, we're hopefully going to steal an urban mech, but if we don't get an urban mech, we'll just steal whatever, because who cares. And we also have some unfinished business, a.k.a. the mission we're supposed to be on. We need to head up into the north, uh, because this, this blacked out area up here is uh, where we got to go. Um, the arrow is telling us to go down. Oh, that's just directing us to where we are. If we look at our handy-dandy map here, though, we can see that uh, there's a village up here that we've yet to explore. And then there's one over here. Um, and there might even be a few things here, but probably not. Oh, there's one there. So there's a couple of villages we'll hit on our way this way. And we are looking for the Inventor's Hut, which is over here. And potentially today, the Star League Cache, which uh, is sort of our ultimate mission. We're looking for that cache. We kind of know where it is already, but that's okay, because I've actually played this so many times, I would kind of know where to head anyway, roughly, roughly. But uh, it's going to save us wandering around needlessly. We've done a lot of wandering and exploring. I definitely have been trying to make sure that we're fully exploring this world as we go through. We're not rushing through the game, even though we... Um, we're, we're kind of skipping combat a lot these days because we've seen so much of it and it is so predictable at this point. But uh, anyway, oh, you know, that was a that was an opportune time to try out those laser rifles. Okay, I take it back. We're going to try and get some combat in. I have $138,000. What can a person spend their money on? I'm literally becoming rich. There was uh, holodisc players. Uh, when you walk over to look at the holodisc, you see nothing but empty shelves. Okay, so you can't buy those. There's, I think there's like literally nothing left to buy in the game. So we just have a, a ton of money just for funsies. So we're just rich for the sake of being rich. Which, if you ask me, is not a bad reason to be ri uh, rich. Okay, so um, let's, let's wait around in here until some humans try and tango with us. Then we will battle them with, a laser, with laser rifles. Watch the lasers fly. Um, and meanwhile, oh, you know what we could do? We could go repair our armor, because I don't think we've done that in forever. We've very rarely been injured, but I think Jason Youngblood's 
uh, armor especially has not been repaired in a long time. So let's go ahead and try and repair our armor. Let's give that a shot here. Armor shop, repair armor, doesn't need it, doesn't need it, doesn't need it, doesn't need it. Boy, talk about effective in combat. $10 to repair and you have 138,022. Now we have 138,012. We just spent 10 bones. We could follow these people around and see if we can actually talk to them. Uh, let's see where they enter. These three people are all going into a building. I have a good feeling. We haven't been able to talk to anyone in forever. I wonder if like Rick Atlas is hanging around or our old pal Jeff Rogers from the training uh, center. Look, there's four guys heading into this building. Surely one of them will want to talk to us. Yes. Talk to others. Nobody's interested in talking to us. There's, there's literally... We, like, scare people away. It's unbelievable. Okay, that guy went in. Let's talk to others. Nobody's interested in talking to us. <laughs> Everyone we knew has died. Or I guess I guess they're with us right now. Like, we have our four compadres, our four best friends forever, the BFF squad. Okay, where are the enemies? Does no one want to fight with me? Everyone's, like, terrified. Everyone's, like, uh, literally everyone who's ever fought this guy has ended up a greasy stain uh, on the on the floor. We already have $31,000. Man, we just keep making more money. It's insane how much money we've made. Look, the, the, that's the remnants of people who tried to fight us. They're just grease stains. Okay, is like li is literally no one going to come fight us? This is crazy. Ah, uh, finally. Okay, four humans have decided to attack. Yes, we will engage in combat. And show us the combat graphics. Alright, so I have a laser rifle. And I'm going to use it against the guy with the rifle. And so let's do this. And, oh, we, we need to figure out what our, our friends have. So Jason has a laser rifle. Rex, Russ, and Rick have Infernos and Zeke. Jason and Zeke have laser rifles. And all the, R, the guys whose names start with R have the bazookas. So we don't want those guys to fire just yet. Because we want to see the destructive power of... Uh, of these laser rifles. So boom, there we go. Continue the fight. Okay, that, that was not as impressive as I was hoping it would be. So a bazooka would kill these guys in one shot for anyone who's watched my uh, my previous videos here. Come on, laser rifle him. Okay, the laser rifles are like more of a sporting weapon, but in terms of sheer effectiveness, this is how you kill someone. Boop, <laughs> you just like rocket them. Okay, so we'll let those guys continue to use their uh, laser rifles on the the guy. And these these other three guys will just kill anyone who decides to wander over this way. Man, that, that laser rifle is like taking forever to kill. It's like so ineffective. Use weapon, kill that guy. Kaboom! <laughs> After invigorating scuffle, you defeat the Curitans. All right, so there we go. That's what a laser rifle looks like. I'm not super impressed, um, but whatever, I'll keep it. It, it. At this stage, I could buy more rocket launchers, but it doesn't really matter because I think our goal here, again, is to steal an urban mech, and if we do so, we're going to get kicked out of the starport forever, so that'll be that. So let's give this a shot here. Entering the arena. So welcome to the arena where modern-day gladiators duel in the 30th century. All right, so she tells you you can rent a mech. Do you want to rent a mech? Yes, I do, because I'm hoping to get an urban mech. Can you just sign me up for the good one? Give me the good mech. Do you want the computer to fight? Uh, I see combat graphics. I have a locust. Use weapons. I can target that, or, or I can target the wall. Shoot at the target as a spectator. You're allowed to shoot into the crowd. That's totally awesome. Um, okay, we're gonna let the computer fight. So we're just gonna let the computer go at, go at this one. Um, this is actually kind of cool that you can like fight in these arena fights and stuff. Here's an example where I think the game had like a really cool idea, but I wish it was implemented a bit better. I wish there was sort of more tactics to like doing well in the arena. So, you know, you can play the stock market. You can be a gladiator in the arena. You can go on RPG adventures. You can have Battletech tactical um, engagements with battle mechs. There's salvaging and, like, 
Um, you know, you have to worry about uh, how much damage you're taking, like a mercenary unit. There's so many cool elements to this game, and it is an old game, so they were certainly limited. I'm sure they wanted to do more with it, but I kind of feel like this game is, like, ripe for a remake, because if every single one of those elements was made a bit deeper, if the stock market was a little deeper, if the arena here was a little deeper, the crowd boos resoundingly, you have lost. Oh, well, let's just do it again. Um, if the arena was a little deeper, if the RPG elements were a bit deeper, if the story was a bit deeper, you know, all these things, if they were a bit deeper, this would be, like, literally one of the best games out there. Um, as it is, I think it is a very, very solid retro game, and I played the hell out of this game. I love the open world expansiveness of it as a kid, but, um, but oh, we got a locust again. But it, uh, it could have been, um... It could have been, it could be more, I think. Um, and again, I'm not knocking what it was when it came out, because there were limits when it came out, but it would be cool to see a remake for this, because uh, there's just, there's so much, there's so much potential here, it's unbelievable. Plus, who doesn't want to see giant mech robots getting into fights with each other? If you don't, you're lying. Okay, so while our mechs just sit here pummeling each other back and forth, I don't even care if I lose this fight. I'm just throwing, I'm just flushing money down the tube trying to get access to an urban mech. I don't know if you have to like win a fight and then you can get an urban mech. Oh look, I just won. Yay, I won 250 C bills. I don't care. Uh, give me your urban mech. I'm going to keep renting mechs until the only mech you have left is an urban mech. No, brief. Yes. I have a locust again. Alright. So just like the fact that... Uh, so when we initially trained in the training center, we stole a training mech and that was really really hard to do i think stealing a mech in the arena is similarly hard to do so it's understandable that this is going to take a while to actually get to work if we do steal an urban mech we have to think long and hard about what mech we want to give up i think we'll dump the stinger the stinger is the worst mech that we have so i think we'll go ahead and dump that one um i think we're d also definitely losing this fight um, it looks like we only have a medium laser left. They've they've shot off our arms. Oh, but we still won the fight. I will take it. By the way, is Jason... This is one of my questions. Is Jason getting skill from this? No, he is not. So I don't know how you're supposed to, like, get more skill. Um, uh, as, as like, how, how you train your mech warriors for that. I guess you don't. Wait, how skilled is Zeke? I think Zeke's a better mech pilot um then jason oh he's a good pilot but he's an unskilled gunner man so all these guys suck <laughs> rex is the only good uh the only good pilot that we've got okay no locust no locust no locust it's a gosh damn locust isn't it every time a locust uh oh you can't flee combat all right well this could take a while so uh why don't i keep at this for a bit and let's just see what happens funny that people are like in the arena just watching two locusts pummel each other to pieces like these are scout mechs these aren't super exciting it's just like just two fast chicken walkers and then they just stand there shooting at each other till one gets destroyed it'd be cooler if this game had all the mechs that were like in its game data files like a zeus versus an atlas and stuff um oh uh, we we just lost we've been winning fights here and there but they keep giving us locusts which uh is not helping anything it's like they don't want to give us anything except the locust. And and we have not fought anything except locusts. Oh wait, this is a different mech. We're fighting, I think we're fighting a wasp or whatever. Yeah, because it has a missile launcher. So that's actually different. Uh, it gives me hope. I really want to see this urban mech though. Like, uh, I, I, I just, I, I want to see, I, even if I fight it, you know what, I'll be happy just fighting an urban mech. See all the like chassis? Of the mechs that have been ruined in this arena by me. It's like I'm just here like crushing, crushing mechs and taking names. And I'm dying about one every, well, 25% of the time I'd say I'm dying. Um, I just, as, as I just die. Okay, that's okay. Resounding boos, boo. Was somebody saying boo earns? <laughs> okay, come on. I'm feeling good about an urban mech. And Irby. Do I have an Irby? Damn it, I do not. I, they gave me a locust again. They they literally have not given me given me anything but a locust. It's crazy. Um, I'm fighting a wasp again, which is kind of cool. 
It's kind of cool that at least the enemies' mechs are changing up. Um, but yes. Okay, come on. Well, I'll give this a handful more tries. You know what I was thinking is that, like, if I can't find the urban mech, then what would be kind of funny is to, like, take one of my own mechs into the arena, but then blast through the wall and run away with it anyway, so to steal my own mech. I think that's what I'll do, I guess, if I can't figure anything else out. Because I definitely don't want to be stealing no locust. Okay, after a number of attempts, I can't even f get myself to fight anything other than locust most of the time. So I'm going to take my own mech into the battlefield. I'm going to take the chameleon, uh, and uh, I'm going to steal my own chameleon just for funsies. Uh, I'm going to get myself banned from the starport for no reason, uh, but uh, the reason other than fun. So let's scan the enemies. It's a locust, as always. Uh, they always give me a locust. I'm fighting locusts. It's a very predictable arena. So we're going to go over this way, and we're going to equip all of our weapons. And we're going to... Oh, I can't... I can't fire on anything but the locust. Okay, I guess you're not allowed to steal your own unit. All right, well, uh, so my attempt to have some fun failed. I guess we're going to have to steal a locust. So we'll go ahead and destroy this locust here. Oh my god, I'm like missing every single shot. He's like doing some damage to me, which is annoying. Because I'm going to have to heal that and whatever. Um, so this is like the last thing to do in the starport. We've, we've literally milked the starport for all of its action. We've purchased everything to purchase. We've made a killing in the stock market. We're even live, leaving $25,000 just to accumulate interest that I don't think we'll ever be able to access again. But it's sort of one of those things that maybe one day my descendants can come in and make some money. But all right, let's go ahead and go into the arena. I want to give it a try. And uh, I want to rent a mech. Give me something good, otherwise I'm stealing the freaking locust. So I have a locust. All right, and off we go, off to the races. And we're going to use a weapon. Ooh, it's a wasp this time, that's pretty cool. So we're gonna target the spectators. I feel like this is like a war crime because we're just gonna like straight up open fire on like a bunch of spectators. But it's, uh, it's how you steal mechs. So it is kind of cool how they like allowed you to be a thief. So here we go. We're running down this way. What, wait, where are we targeting? Uh, machine gun. Okay, it's right down there. Good, go for it. Boom! We just blowed up the spectator. Your mech has destroyed part of the arena. Some Kirita urban mechs have been dispatched to kill you. Yes! Finally, urban mechs. Where are they? Uh, scan unit enemies. Yo, okay, so there's a wasp. And there's an urban mech and an urban mech. So there is an urban mech. Let's just scan it just to see. An auto cannon 10! I have never seen that in this game ever. That is so cool. All right, so they've been dispatched to kill me. Let's get the hell out of here with our sweet, sweet locust that we have stolen. And hopefully the urban mechs don't destroy us. Oh, God. We're taking, like, heavy damage. This mech is not worth stealing. Um, the operators of the arena look on in horror as you waltz a uh, 1.5 million Seabell locust out of the arena and escape. You definitely maneuver the pursuing urban mechs and now own a locust free and clear. The rest of your group, having watched uh, the spectacle from the stands, acted quickly and gathering together outside the starport to meet up with you. Uh, if you survived. In all the commotion surrounding your daring theft of a mech, the guys at the parking garage weren't paying careful attention. Your group managed to recover the mechs without paying the fees. You do, however, think it prudent that you not show your face around the starport for a long, long time. Every draconian soldier should have your face memorized right now. There's a hefty price on your head. Damn, we just stole a robot. <laughs> so Rex is going to pilot the chameleon. Jason is going to pilot the commando. Uh, Zeke is piloting his stinger, and then we have Rick will be in the locust. Russ will be in the locust. Oh, no, no, there's no one to pilot the locust. So you be in the chameleon, and you be in the commando. So we're literally just going to, like, leave a locust. Not all your mechs have pilots. You'll have to abandon any mech that doesn't have a pilot. Are you ready to abandon your non-piloted mechs? Yes, I am. We stole a locust. For absolutely no reason. And let's see what happens. Uh, so there's there's the arena that we can now no longer go in. Actually, interestingly, if we only had... If we were only one you know, unit, we would be able to just waltz in there. 
just kind of interesting. What happens if we go back uh, in here? Enter the mech garage. They still haven't forgotten about your rampage of, of slaughter and destruction when you stole a mech from here. It would not be wise to re-enter the starport until they do. All right, well, we just screwed ourselves over hardcore for absolutely nothing. Um, if we had at least stolen an urban mech, I would have said uh, we would uh, not load our game, but I think we're going to go ahead, obviously, and load and undo that, but that was a bit of fun. That was kind of cool. We, uh, we, we stole a mech and we slaughtered a bunch of innocent people who were just watching the arena. Um... Again, this is this is what I mean. Where in, in like earlier videos, I was saying one cool thing about this game is it makes you feel like there's just there's there's so many you don't know what the boundaries of this game are. Like, yo, you can like steal a mech, or like, yo, you can, uh, you know, you you can just like full up blow up a wall. You know, like there's a lot of kind of cool stuff that makes it feel like you can just do anything in this game, which is pretty neat. Anyway, let's pay to get our mechs out. Uh, that all looks good. Boom. All right. Um, oops. Uh, don't load our game. In fact, let's save our game in game number two. So you can steal mechs if you ever are given an urban mech to pilot. You can totally steal it. And you totally should in that case because you're never going to see that again. And I'd be curious to know if you can take urban mechs to the speed shop and get them upgraded. Anyway, for today, so we've had our fun. We've had our funsies. For today, we're going to be heading north. And specifically, we're going to pass through this village here before kind of looping around to this village, before going to the inventor's hut, to this village, to the Star League cache right here. That is our mission for today, to get to the Star League. So uh, let's do it. Off we go. Off to Grand Adventures. We have $140,000 in our pockets. That's awesome. Who cares about battle anymore and like technology? Let's just retire as millionaires. You know, you know what the, the true story here is? It's the story of a guy who's really good at playing the stock market. Uh, that, that, is, that, is the true, uh, that is a true skill to have. I mean, Jason Youngblood could be rich for all his days. If only he abandoned the silly obsession with battle mechs and just got into uh, high finance. He's the wolf, of, the wolf of Pacifica, the wolf of Steiner. Um, yeah. So we've done a lot of cool things in this game so far. Um, it's it's kind of crazy that we've only explored like half the planet. But it, it is kind of the case that eventually you figure out that most of the villages are the same. Some will have a mech at lube. They'll all have an armor shop. Damn, that mech went down like nothing. That mech was made of paper mache. They all have an armor shop. They have a weapon shop. You know, the lounge. No one ever wants to talk to you. There's sometimes like a unique building, like a mayor's house that you can break into that we did that one time or like a theater. So there's there's some stuff. But uh, realistically, it's it's, uh, you know, I said this in one of the other videos. Uh, there, there could be more to this game. And actually, I think I said this at the beginning of this video, too, um, before I spent like 40 minutes trying to get an urban mech in the arena. So I've already forgotten but yeah, it's, it's, you know, they're, they're, uh, it, there's so much potential here. Um, but as a kid, I, I loved exploring this, uh, this whole world. You know, I never knew what the limits were. I never knew how much of the world existed out there. Then eventually you find out that eh, there's about eight villages to explore and so on. And you get the gist of it. But, um, man, this one locust wandered into the wrong part of town. Um, okay. <laughs> I don't know why it just gave me control there. It's like, hey, by the way, do you want to keep the battle going? Or, like, should we just quit? Or, Okay, so explore this way. The village is up here somewhere. I would like to know, like, at what point the curative forces decide that we're more than just a minor inconvenience. Wait a minute. I think the village is... I think we walked right by the village. I think it's, like, right down here. Like, eventually you'd think that they would, like, uh, set up, like, a task force to come, like, wipe us out. So there's like a mech at lube, which we don't really need anymore because we're so hyper upgraded and beastly. Oh, there's like a, there's a door here. Let's see what this is. I like how these weapon shop, I like how these uh, villages out in the middle of nowhere, the buildings are spaced out far enough that battle mechs can walk around between them because they know, they know that customers are coming in battle mechs. Uh, yes. Search the medical records. Nothing. That's like the same message we've seen like a dozen times. Um, they, they know that, like, people in battle mechs are coming out here, so they're like, better space out the buildings, Chuck, so that the mechs can walk through here. It's the only, vi that's the only visitors we get out here. Um, uh, these are, like, 
Like, realistically, these villages are kind of, like, in the middle of in the middle of nowhere. Like, half built in the forest and stuff. They're kind of like Ewok villages. Talk to someone, no one's interested. No one is ever interested. You know, I get the feeling that actually when they were designing this game, there was supposed to be more going on, like, with the lounges and stuff. But they, they maybe never got a chance to finish it. So this is actually a question I have. Does anyone know, were the developers... Did they include everything that they wanted to in this game, or did they not? Because I've said it multiple times, but the game has the code for all the battle mechs up to the 3050 era in Battletech, but it only really uses a handful of light mechs. So I kind of wonder, like, did they actually intend for this game to be much bigger than it was, but they, like, ran out of development time, or they realized computers of the era weren't powerful enough to, like, uh, handle their vision? Because if so, that would be kind of cool, like... They'd intended there to be more than there ever actually was. Um, but I don't know. I mean, sometimes that happens with games. Um, I mean, like, in theory, one basic thing in Battletech is that uh, the basic size of a group of mechs is four mechs. That's a lance. And that's like a, like a, a platoon of mechs, basically. Uh, but you can only get three in this game. You would have thought that they would have done four. Four is... A lance, and so you would think that they would be like, okay, well, you have to be able to have four uh, mechs, but you can't. So that again, that makes me feel like it was unfinished in some way, but I don't know. I mean, they certainly made up for it in the sequel in Crescent Hawk's Revenge. You could have up to twelve mechs, uh, which is pretty awesome. Um, if you guys have not watched my Crescent Hawk's Revenge videos, you definitely should check them out. Uh, Crescent Hawk's Revenge is like. Like a whole different game, um, way more on the tactical battle mech side of things, but and way less RPG, but very a very good game in its own right, basically. Um, man, I, I don't even know why they come after us anymore. You just you know what you're gonna get. You're gonna get a face full of lasers. Why? Why did you try? Why did you do this, man? I didn't want to have to embarrass you in front of your curated brothers, but now you're going down. Kablam. Um, part of me also thinks that maybe they kept it to light mechs to just keep mechs easier to destroy. That was sort of, you know, because mechs go down a lot easier when they're light. So that was one other idea I had. Because that was one village. Where was the other village? So we're like right here. So the village must just be to our left. Okay. And then we can go over here and here. All right. Heading to the left for this village. Um, so what is the coolest thing that you guys have seen in this game so far? Um, I like the times that we kind of like broke the rules. So like uh, when we broke the guy out of jail, that was fun for me. Um, oh, there's the village. We're at it. I'm like, where's the village? We're here. We broke the guy out of jail. When we saw the theater movie, that was cool. Hey, a clothing shop. Um, I, I liked getting in the fights in the starport with our bazookas. Oh, that was kind of fun. Although it does, it does get it yeah, predictable eventually. Um, I liked blowing the the hole in the arena wall. That was fun. Anything cool here? Same stuff. Every all the stores have the exact same inventory. Um, if they had different stuff, it'd be a little cooler, I think. Also, the speed shops always upgrade your mechs the same way. You know, it'd be kind of cool too if anyone ever remade this is to like make it so that different speed shops would offer you different ways to upgrade your mech so you could kind of like think like hmm how do i want to upgrade my mech like that'd be pretty cool um the lounge no I, i'm so every time i can't skip past a lounge because you never know maybe this will be the one maybe this will be the mythical lounge where people will talk to me no one's ever interested <laughs> never never is anyone interested hospital records nothing it's like we're, we're kind of at a point in the game where there's 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 very little left to do like we've we've basically explored everything i used to get so excited when i was a kid and i would play this game and i would discover a new town because it'd be like whoa like what's this town and like this town is kind of cool like every town's different this is kind of like a water town like look at it it's like there's a lot like water has flooded this town now uh, the computer's gonna have to fight for us hold on a second we have a mech combat that's going on uh, but yeah, this is like, the, every town had its own unique personality. There was a town with the mayor. There was a town that sort of had walls uh, built out of buildings around it. The starport feels very different. The starport definitely feels like a giant sort of like a commercial um, hub compared to these smaller villages, which is cool. The smaller villages, you get in like mech fights with other mechs, so that's neat. Like there, there's a lot of variety here. 
There's a lot of variety. Um, but then, like, certain things, like, the shops are, like, identical throughout, you know. And there's there's maybe, like, one unique encounter per village. Like, we had the one weapon shop where the guy's being held hostage and he gave us laser weapons, which turns out suck, but whatever. Uh, they were free. Um, then when they, there was, like, the guy that had the house that had the mayor's house and stuff like that. Or the village with the mayor's house. Like, there's always something. Another! <laughs> Instantly, I'm in combat again. This is crazy. Um, so the, oh, I just blew up the head of that mech. That would be a good mech to salvage, by the way, if I so needed. So I think I said in, a, in one of the other videos, but if you only have, if you're a mech short, then sometimes you can salvage a mech, which maybe we should do that. Maybe we should, uh, let's see, repair the mechs, repair the mechs, repair the mechs. You know what? Here's the deal. I'm going to let the stinger get destroyed just to see what happens. Just out of curiosity. Um, so the next time we have combat, we're going to let the stinger get destroyed. And then we're going to destroy the other mech. And we're going to see if we can salvage a mech. That's one thing we have not done. And I would like to do that. So we're going to... Uh, sure enough, in, in any second now, we'll get into combat. The enemies have been chasing us like crazy. Yes, engage in combat. No verbose sea combat graphics yes so where are the enemies they are southeast perfect so the stinger is going to run straight into combat oh no the stinger is going to jump oh no okay the stinger is going to hobble into combat its leg is severely damaged and meanwhile the other two mechs are just going to flee this way and hopefully zeke doesn't get killed because he is he's our pilot we kind of need him so you keep fleeing, you keep fleeing. There we go. Okay. So the, the enemy is taking Zeke to task here. <laughs> We're not allowed to watch it happen. Zeke is just getting crushed there. Crushed, crushed, crushed. Okay, Zeke's, Zeke's uh, mech is destroyed. Okay, Zeke, you better run, boy. Meanwhile... We are gonna run this way, and we are gonna use, the, we're gonna unleash the fury of our weapons on that locust to try and down it right away. The only thing where this could backfire is if Zeke gets stomped to death. And if he does, he does, you know. We, you gotta take chances in this world. You can't keep playing it safe all the time. But hopefully Zeke doesn't get stomped to death. It would, it would be a crying shame if Zeke did get stomped to death. Cause that's not what we want. Um, so hopefully this enemy mech here just sits there and takes it. Kaboom, 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 kaboom. We might actually have to backtrack to the previous town if we do salvage this mech to, like, take it to the mech it lube and, like, repair it. And maybe even, like, run it through the speed shop. Because a stock locust sucks. We definitely want to upgrade that thing. Uh, make it a contender. I mean, we just threw away a perfectly good stinger for absolutely no reason, because... Because we could. I mean, that's what being rich is. After invigorating Scuffle, you defeated the Curitans. Ruck uses, Russ uses his tech training to salvage armor, heat sinks, weapons, and infrastructure from the enemy mechs. You're able to scrounge to an Look! Zeke is a qualified py pilot without a mech. Do you want to salvage one of the wrecks? Yes, I do. Russ is inspecting the wrecks. Russ is salvaging a stinger. Oh, <laughs> he's salvaging the mech that, uh, that I threw away. Inspect the stinger... Um, okay, so, yeah, see, this is a salvaged mech. It has a gyro and engine damage. So, we might have thrown a mech away for absolutely no reason. But, hey, you know what? It was all for science. It was all in the name of science. So, there you go. So, you can salvage mechs in this game, which is actually totally cool. If we didn't have three mechs, uh, you know, if we had fled the prison without getting... Um, Zeke's mech out of uh, out of the impound lot, then you can actually you can actually still salvage mech. So this is a really cool part of this game. This game is such cool mech mechanics. Um, stop! Like now the enemies like really want to fight me now that I'm like hobbled and I've damaged my mech stupidly for no reason. But it was it was fun, um, and, and like we're so overpowered at this point, it like does it matter? Like, let's repair this stinger. 156, uh, 81 sea bills. There's 600, 200. We should spend about a thousand bucks. 
That's uh, that's reasonable to repair the stinger that was completely undamaged until we let it be destroyed. So there you go. Um, and now we have to fight a mech to like earn our way out of this town. It's like they just can't get enough of us. It's like they have. It's like they don't like us or something. Like they're an invading enemy force that just wants to see us destroyed. But uh, boom. Um. So I don't think I've talked about this yet, but um, I'm just gonna put like a small little like uh, pitch in there for BattleTech for anyone anyone who's watched this so far who's been like kind of interested by the oh my god again by my videos if you have never read about BattleTech before I, I liken it to like Game of Thrones in space where there's all these different great houses vying for power and it's very like medieval in feeling so like. Basically, in the Battletech universe, humans have colonized space, and uh, there's all these planets that are colonized, but it's really hard to travel between planets, so every planet is semi-isolated um, away from other planets, and you it, it's really expensive to travel between planets, and you need jump ships that take weeks to recharge. And, like, if you want to send a message to other planets, you can either, like, write a letter and have it physically carried on jump ships to another planet, or you can send it through Comstar, which is basically like sending a raven in Game of Thrones. And just like in Game of Thrones, how the maesters control the ravens, Comstar is like a cultish organization that controls the hyperpulse generators that allow you to send messages between stars. So there's like a lot of uh, a lot of similarities between Game of Thrones and Battletech. And it's I, I've always thought it's like ripe for a TV show. So in this in this game, uh, you are playing Jason Youngblood, who uh, is affiliated with House Steiner which is in control of the Lyran Commonwealth, uh, which controls this planet, which is being invaded by the Draconis Combine, which is controlled by House Kurita, which are sort of like the Japanese um, Asian-styled uh, empire. Uh, you know, samurai and honor and stuff like that. The Steiners are all about commerce, and they're sort of German in nature. They're actually not great fighters. Um, the Federated Sons are the other sort of um, European-style... Um, although I guess like Merrick and Lyo. No, Lyo is like Chinese. I don't know what Merrick is, to be totally honest. But anyway, there's five great houses. Tons of cool backstory. And it all takes... It's sort of this like medieval world in space where there's giant robots and stuff. It's it's great. As I say, I used to read the novels when I was a kid. And I was like obsessed with them. Michael A. Stackpole. I would read his novels. Any Michael A. Stackpole novel about Battletech, I would read instantly it was an instant sale i would go to uh like chapters which is like the canadian version of like barnes and noble or whatever and i would just uh go to the the sci-fi section i would look to see what what battletech books they had and if it was one i didn't have i would buy and eventually i had like a bookshelf of like 40 of these books and i i owned like almost every battletech novel it was like for a while you know i'm, I'm so cool it was the only novel i only kind of novels i read i'm, I'm that cool and I just admitted it to you guys. I used to read Battletech sci-fi novels. Like, like not even, like, not even like a mainstream sci-fi nerd. That's like obscure specific sci-fi nerd. Like I'm reading like the obscure sci-fi, you know, like that's how, how much of a hardcore nerd I was. Uh, okay. Was. I still am in many ways. As you can guess, I have a YouTube channel for gaming. Okay, so there's the city we were. Wait, where are we trying to get to? So we were here, now we're like here. Oh, we want to go straight down. And that's where the inventor's hut is. Okay, so we go over a bit and then we go straight down. Gotcha. So over about like here, a little bit more. And four humans are trying to engage us. Again, I don't think those guys know what they're doing. Hey, we found a hut. We found a hut. Okay, here's some adventure for us. Will you enter the inventor's hut? Don't mind if I do. This place is fantastic. From the outside, it looks like a dilapidated hut. But once you get inside, you are amazed by what you see. The interior dimensions look easily four times the size uh, the outside hints at. Though some tricks of refraction combined with the fact that much of the ground has been removed and the interior is substantially deeper than you would have thought. Well, okay. All around you, scientific projects, experiments, and other devices proliferate. It is very difficult to walk in here because of the equipment covering the floor, uh, perch precariously on tables, shelves, threaten to smash into the floor and thus ruin any chance you have of Dr. Tellhim helping you. 
You can't see anyone who actually lives here, so you keep exploring around one corner. You are floored by a ghastly apparition stretching easily 30 feet in the air. A monolithic face stares back at you. Clearly, it is some sort of optical illusion, but it is optically unpleasant to look at since the fantastic size magnifies each hair and pore until you're sure you would lose an arm um, in one if you got too close. Jeez. Um, there's some sort of repulsion barrier in this room which makes it impossible to proceed. You spend valuable minutes trying to get past it, only to be frustrated at every attempt. As a last resort, you try speaking to the face. H Hello? The eyes snap open and look maliciously at you. The sneer it gives you makes you feel insignificant. And when the mouth opens and bellows at you, you can almost feel your hair being whipped back by the winds of its breath. The face is demanding the meaning of your interruption. What is this, the Wizard of Oz? Oh, great and powerful holographic head. I am come to seek your help. You stammer out that you're here to see Dr. Edward tell him. The face squints as if it's trying to make out the features on your tiny face, then hisses out an ultimatum. Answer and be accepted. Fail and be dissected. Yikes. The face then sits back to watch your reaction and seems to be satisfied by the obvious nervousness that is inflicted in you. However, you regain your composure by reassuring yourself that it is only a holographic manifestation and cannot do you any harm. I mean, we're, we're it's four, four dudes, five dudes in a room, full body armor, packing laser rifles and rocket launchers with three giant battle mechs. A holographic face ain't going to do nothing to us. We can, demol we can bring, burn this building to the ground if we want. You boldly tell the face to ask away. It seems impressed by your courage. The face then sneers in an unfriendly manner and proceeds to ask horribly intricate technical questions of your mechanics. Your technician rises to the occasion, authoritatively answering the question. The face looks shocked that anybody would know the answer to his riddle and vanishes. Your group proceeds down the hall a bit more nervously than before. Rounding one corner, um, you hold up a hand of caution to stop the group. You want to play it safe. When the floor slides apart, you are dropped to the next level of the complex. See, this part would be cool if you were actually in control instead of just reading it. Um, you try valiantly, valiantly to gather your wits about you while you try to calm everyone's nerves. Rex assesses the situation and declares that you are in no immediate danger. How the hell does he know? The room is engulfed in a blaze of color and you are once again face to face with the face. It looks substantially meaner and grills you with a new question. This one involves biochemistry and neurological impulse terminology. Your doctor stands boldly forth and answers the question. He even manages to lecture the face thoroughly on the subject. The face gets bored and vanishes to escape the onslaught of information. What would happen if our tech guy and our doctor guy were dead? I, I think it is the case that if you lose a person or two, you can recruit different people. But I don't know how many can die before you kind of get screwed. So I wonder, like, like I've actually, every time I've ever played this game, I've never lost someone. I've always bought good armor and kept them in health and stuff like that. But if you do lose people, you can find new people. I know that's true. I just don't know where to find them and or what their background is. You must be able to find doctors and techs, though, to, to get past this part. A wall slides up in front of you, and you proceed through a scientific, a scientist's playground of gadgets and devices. There are things here that your tech can't begin to understand. You use the respite to gather your wits and nerves because you're sure the face will return. You chastise yourself for thinking of it um, as if it will read your mind and reappear. It does. This time, it's not sitting still like some statue. Um, instead, it circles the group, sneering and snarling like some desperate shark. It wastes little time before spitting out the next question, a historical fact about the tactical techniques used in the Battle of Mallory's world. Rex allows the face no time to gloat by instantly answering the question from first-hand experience. The face looks about to panic, and it vanishes. The group proceeds around another corner, and this one is a dead end. You don't leave, however, knowing that this place is full of surprises, and this dead end may be more than that. As you look for the hidden exit, the face reappears. Seems satisfied uh, with the others uh, who have answered its questions and zooms in on you. You believe bravely hold your ground as the face comes so close that you could use its pupil you could use the pupil of its eye as a full height mirror. The face stares at you for a while, then hisses out a question. Jason Youngblood, tell me where your father is. 
I don't know where my father is. You say you don't know. The face repeats the question. I don't know. It demands an answer. He's dead. The face grows more angry. He's dead. He's dead. The emotion is taking you over. The face bellows, tell me. Tell you. I'll show you. With that declaration, you unholster a machine gun. I had a machine gun? And fire round after round into the horrible face. A look of genuine surprise shows on the face, and it vanishes. You continue firing... Tiring of these games, tired from exhaustion, and fueled by frustration. I feel like in the the sequel to this video game, Jason Youngblood has far more patience. He's not like this. This seems like an angsty teen. As soon as your ammo clip runs out, a side door pops open and the face reappears. This time it's a human size and attached to the rest of the body. If I was in interrogating people and they just opened fire with a machine gun in my lab, I wouldn't reveal my physical form to them. I'd probably kick them out. Hey, 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 what do you think you're doing? Put that thing away. The lanky man is pulling at his face, and globs of distorted makeup are coming off. The face under that mess, staring back at you now, it belongs to Dr. Edward Tellum. So good. He was not the guy I killed in part two. There was a different Edward. There was an Edward that betrayed me. I might have murdered him, but it's not this guy. Still running on adrenaline, you heft the machine gun and demand an explanation from him regarding the questions about your father. Dr. Tellum explains that Jeremiah still owes him some sea bills and some Zentarian ribeye steak for the lock he created, and he just wanted to collect. Oh, it was just a zany misunderstanding. Well, that's okay. You then demand the meaning of this gauntlet you were forced to run. He explains that it is meant to scare off peddlers and salesmen. Uh, it's like the most elaborate... Uh, no solicitor sign ever. It's like a giant holographic head that asks you riddles in a series of trap rooms. Uh, the questions will screen out anyone who's too unintelligent to waste time talking to. He then expressed his sorrow over your father's death because Jeremiah was a good man. Let me get this straight. This guy designed a giant holographic head and a series of intricate riddles to weed out people who were too unintelligent for him to bother talking to. But when, every, when anyone wanders into his house... He ends up spending like 30 minutes, like turning on all his holographic stuff, getting getting in his like Wizard of Oz chair, projecting his face all over, run, carefully running people through the different rooms of his house with the riddles. Do you know how much time that would take? When people knock on my door, when I when somebody knocks on my door and I peek out the window and it's a solicitor, I literally don't open the door. I'm like, I just don't have time for that. That's what, this guy needs a front door. He doesn't need holographic giant heads. Dumbest smart man I've ever heard of. Anyway, this brings you back to the real reason you're here. You show him the hollow disc and ask if he could repair it for you. He says it would be the least he could do after what he's put you through. He rubs some complex goo on the disc, then runs it through some sort of buffing machine. When that is done, he hands it back to you. You examine the surface and you're impressed with the excellence repair. There's no evidence it was ever damaged. Ask if there's a private room you could uh, retire so you may view the rest of the message. He leads you to a small room with a viewer in it. You watch the rest of the message and learn the password. There's also quite a bit of mushy stuff, and it takes you several minutes to regain your composure before you can return to the others. You offer to pay your father's debt, but the eccentric old inventor weighs it away and said, ask what he can do for you. Dude, I have $140,000 in my pocket. How much does my dad owe you? Like a grand? I'll, I'll, I'll give you 10. <laughs> You ask for directions to the nearest Starly cache and are shocked when he tells you it's hidden in a cave just southeast of here. You thank him and leave his hut. There we go. All right, we're, we're rounding the end, guys. There's very little left to do. Southeast is where we got to go. Before we do that, though, if you look, we, we're here. There's one more thing to explore over here, and then it's a straight shot to the Starly cache. So let's just go see what this thing is. I'm sure it's just one last town, but I just have to know. We can't leave any stone unturned here, guys. Uh, we don't often play through entire video games, but I want this to be like a definitive let's play for this channel of the Crescent Hawks Inception. I had a lot of fun back when I played the Crescent Hawks Revenge, which I think I like a little bit more than this, but it's interesting. So I have a really interesting history with this game. Um, I loved Battletech growing up. This is the first Battletech game that I ever experienced and I loved it and I, I still do. I, I, I really like this game, still have a soft spot for it. Um, I love the RPG elements, the mech combat, all that stuff. Um, uh, my uncle had a copy of this way back in the day on his like IBM like 186 basically. I made a copy of his, his five and a quarter inch floppy disk, took it home, started playing this game every day after school. I would sit in class and just dream about being done in school so I could play this game. 
And I just played it into the ground. I, I played it over and over again. I loved it. I explored every aspect um, of this game. And actually, interestingly, I could make it to the end, but I couldn't beat it. And when we get to the Star League cache, I'll explain what I had trouble with. But I would always fantasize that there was another... Um, there'd be a sequel to this. But, like, back in the day before the internet, it's like, I had no way of verifying if there ever was. I, like, I'd never heard of this before or since. Like, I got into the Battletech board game and stuff because of this game. And I, I started buying novels and stuff. But, like, I didn't know if there were any more video games. And then I was on vacation uh, one year. And I went into... Oh, here's here's that final village. I was on vacation one year. And I went into a... Um, uh, oh, the hospital. I went into a uh, random uh, computer shop and sitting on the shelf was a box and it was selling the Crescent Hawks Inception. I was like, whoa, I've never seen that in stores. That's cool. Um, ooh, the Comstar station. Inspect our accounts. We have $75,000. Wow. So if you do get booted out of the um, starport and you can't come back, there is another Comstar station way up here. This is the only one I've ever seen outside of the starport. So it's like, at least there's one more. But yeah, we like explored the whole world and we didn't see uh, another one. But anyway, um, I was like, oh, it looks like the Crescent Hawks Inception. But then I did a double take. It was a three pack uh, game. It, it, you know, it was selling three games in one. Crescent Hawks Inception, Mech Warrior Number One, which is another game that I'm going to play one day uh, for you guys. Um, not Mech Warrior Two, but Mech Warrior One, and a game called The Crescent Hawks Revenge. My mind literally exploded. My little child mind exploded, uh, and I was like, "What? They made a sequel to The Crescent Hawks Inception? Uh, the game cost twenty dollars. I literally dropped everything." And I ran back to where my mom was because I had walked up to town and I was just like wandering around checking out some stores. I ran back to where my mom was and I begged her for $20. I said it was the only thing I wanted for the entire summer. She gave me the 20 bucks. I ran back up to town because I was afraid someone else would buy this game and I bought it. And this was like the second day of my summer vacation and we were going to be, uh, we were staying at my grandma's trailer um, sort of up north in Ontario. We were going to be there for like two or three weeks. I opened the game box, started reading the instruction manual, and for the next two two weeks, I just fantasized about going home and playing the sequel. And I finally did. So the Crescent Hawks Revenge is a similarly very special game to me because it is the sequel to this game, which I loved. And when I discovered it, it was like finding... You know, finding out that they made a sequel to one of your favorite games ever that you never knew about. So, um, yeah. So, when I played the Crescent Hawks Revenge for this channel, it was just, you know, that that's like a love letter to a game that I loved as a kid. And this, this game, similarly, is a similar experience. So, um, I like them for different reasons. I like this one because it was the first, and this was more like an RPG. Crescent Hawks Revenge is more of a tactical game. Very different, but very solid. Um, definitely would recommend that one as well. And if you've never heard of it again, there's a Let's Play on my channel. You can check it out. You can see the whole game if you'd like. Um, it is a very hard game, but it is a very battle tech game. And anyway, that was the last village. Kind of kind of a small village, to be totally honest. Has a Comstar station, which is cool. Um, but other than that, I mean, I think we've definitely reached the end where... There's absolutely nothing left to do in any of these villages. They're cool. This one is cool. It kind of has like a dilapidated wall. Like it's like a mini starport. But uh, there's there's not too much to say about that village. So that's it. We've, we've, we've explored literally the entire world. Or everything substantial about it. We've explored all the villages. There's some more islands and stuff to explore. But there's nothing out there. So there's just like no reason to go there. There's a lot more villages in the southwest than there is um, sort of in the north. But anyway, coming back to where we are. Okay, this is it. We're heading for the Starly Cache, guys. Um, this is this is sort of the final section of the game. Um, the game exists in multiple sections. You know, like when you're in person mode, wandering around, um, and going through like the RPG elements and stuff. When you're in mech mode here. Um, and then also the last section is a little different from anything that we have seen. But this is this is the final section of the game that was like really really hard for me. <laughs> um, I think uh, I will tell you right now that there is no final climactic battle. I think one thing that's missing that was missing in this game 
was to actually sort of put all your skills to use. So as you'll see, there it's there is gameplay. It's not just you reading about the end, but it it's not. Um, it, it could have been basically more. Anyway, here's a Star League cache. So we're gonna go into it. Will you enter the small cave? You found what can only be the entranceway to the Star League cache. On the door is uh, is a lock of the type your father described in his hollow message to you. There's also a retinal scanner, which almost has Rex's name printed on it. Was it like custom form to his eyeball? Um, by the way, the Star League is like an ancient um, organization that once ran the universe. And they had really advanced technology. And when the Star League fell, basically all the other houses started to infight. And they like bombed each other decades backwards in technology. Um, Star Lake is kind of like the Valyrian Empire. It's not a great, a perfect analogy, but if you think Game of Thrones, you know, they had more advanced technology than anyone else had, but now they're kind of gone. But then there's still Valyrian swords floating around there and people like covet them because they're advanced technology. Same way with Star League tech in the Battletech universe. Anytime people can get their hands on Star League technology, it's like leagues above the, the standard tech that's floating around. Anyway, Rex steps up to the machine and puts his eye over the scanner. It registers a match, and the panel slides back to reveal a sophisticated input device, obviously intended for you to enter the password. You, <laughs> a sophisticated input device. You mean a keyboard? Uh, you type in the password, and the door slides away, allowing you to enter the cache. Boom! Look at this. As you enter the cache, you see a note pin on the wall addressed to you. Jason. The key to getting uh, to the cache is to use the code and imprint the right codes onto it. Each door needs a red, blue, and yellow code. Each terminal imprints a single code. No code is reused, and the card can only hold one red, one blue, and one yellow code at a time. When you get to the map room, use the map I gave you. It will help, uh, it will help you. Good luck. Love, Dad. You take the code uh, on the table and proceed into the Star League cache. So here's the last section of the game. Well, sort of. Star League. This is a puzzle section. Game totally changes. There's no more combat left in the game, which actually honestly kind of sucks. Uh, I remember getting to this part in the game as a kid and be like, whoa, look at this. It's so cool. And thinking that there was going to be a lot more to do with this. But uh, as you'll see, it's, uh, it's basically sort of um, just try your luck. So security terminal red one, we will take. We will take. We don't want red two yet. Let's just see what happens here. Uh, red code, incorrect, blue, incorrect, yellow, incorrect. All right. How about this? Blue and yellow are incorrect. All right. Blue three and yellow four. Sure. What one is this? Yellow five. Nope. So let's try this. Yellow code is incorrect. Let's take the yellow code and boom, we open the door. So you kind of go around getting different blue, green, and yellows. So this is yellow six. Okay, so let's, oh, and let's switch our red one to red two, I think it was. Uh, you've already used, okay, I was going to say, will it tell us if we've already used a code? It will. So we got red two. So this is basically uh, trial and error time, where you just kind of like go through and you're like, what code does it need? So we got the right red. We got the wrong yellow. Uh, let's try this blue. We got the right blue. Let's see if we can find the right yellow. Yellow code four, let's do it. And wrong yellow. Is there another yellow over here? Uh, we've used this one. Uh, we've used this one. Yellow four. Uh, yeah, okay, let's try yellow six. Why not? Why not? Uh, incorrect yellow. Okay, so we're in the business for a different yellow. Uh, let's see what we got here. So as you can imagine, there's a lot of running around here. This is a big old map. Swamp Rats. I don't know what that's referring to. Is that a reference to another Infocom game? Because this is an old Westwood Infocom game. Let's see here. This is Blue 27. No. Oh, God. There's like Blue 2, 3, 4. Blue 27. Jesus, like, this is gonna take a while. Like, I kinda wanna, like, show you guys the maze because, like, I want this to be, like, you know, a, a complete playthrough. But at the same time, I'm kinda thinking, like, yikes. Okay, we got a new yellow, so we can run back and try. Let's just 
hop in here real quick. Look, we're in the Hyperpulse generator room. It's pretty cool, eh? You, you can actually send a message or check your stocks uh, because, you know, Comstar is no longer in the way. Oh, man, we should check our stocks. How much money have we made? Whatever happens, we're leaving this planet with 140 Gs. We also have 75,000 in trust fund money just hanging around. God, if only that were real, man. If only that were real. Okay, we got a new yellow. Uh, that was the only thing I was able to find. Oh, look, and there's stuff over here, too. Yikes. Blue 31. Nope. Okay, let's head back and try our door code here. You kind of have to, like, really use your memory, too, because you have to, like, remember what door you had the key, key for. There we go. So you, you think, oh, yeah, we're making progress. Just a few more of these. Nope, it's like, it's getting worse and worse. Look at all these things. Blue, like we just have, now we have like an in, an infinite amount of possibilities here. So I have them blue and a red. Um, I don't want that. So <clears throat> I think the next door that we need to open is somewhere around here. This is going to take a while. So I am actually going, oh, we just need a yellow code. Okay, that's a good sign. This is going to take a while. So I, uh, for, for your own sanity, so you're not just watching me go around in circles here, uh, I'm going to skip past a lot of this because it's, uh, um, I remember this, I remember playing this part as a kid and like literally it's just, it, it just, all it does is it takes a lot of time. There's a lot of walking around and backtracking, but other than that, like there's really nothing to it. So if you're curious on how to beat the maze, you might want to look up a tutorial or watch somebody else like uh, who who knows the exact sequence do it because I'm I'm basically going to be doing trial and error, and this is going to take a lot of trial and a lot of error. By the way, you at least have a handy overhead map. So here's the maze. Um, I just you know the only thing I wish is that these different terminals would highlight would like glow red, green, or blue, so you at least knew what color uh, their code was. And if after you use them, they stopped glowing. The, the, the only two things. I would make this part. This part is like a big pain in the butt. This part would be so much more doable if they just made those two minor changes. By the way, after like 15 minutes of wandering around and not being able to open up a single other door, I uh, found this good old map here that tells you basically what you need to do. So if you are going to play the Crescent Hawks Inception, I definitely recommend looking up this map. So you can see here it lists all the different doors, uh, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, all the way up to, to K. And then down here, you got the good old legend telling you which door requires which numbers to open. So again, if you are looking to open a specific door, you can just go ahead and look it up, look where the, the terminals are, and you can open it that way. You could do this by trial and error. But my god, is this section punishing and hard on the old memory. So unless you're a kid who's doing this after school like I was back in grade 8, you probably don't have the time to uh, to kill on this one. Like, what's really kind of punishing about this is you have to, like, walk to the far end of the map, and then you have to walk all the way back to the other end. I mean, it's, it's like there's so much backtracking, it's crazy. And not only that, it's a maze. Like, it's not, it's not even, like, straight backtracking. It's, like, actually very confusing. And then you kind of have to, like, remember where you're going and where you've been and what you've unlocked. And, oh, my God, where's the door even that I'm looking for? It's somewhere around here. I've got all the key codes I need for door number D or door letter D. Um, I just got to, like, find the door now. So, like... Yeah, this is this is this is crazy. <laughs> I spent like a several minutes on this one door, and I already know all the things I need. But it's like finding the door is the challenge. Uh, I think it's up here, maybe. Nope, still can't find the door. Looking for it. Want to find it? Want to open it? Here it is. Oh, that's the incorrect code. Wait, 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 wait. What door am I looking for here? Door D. Oh, I'm at K. Oh, so I gotta go down and around. Oh my god. Yeah, like, uh, the, I, I don't know how you do this legit, this section. This is just crazy. Boom! We got another door open. Only took like eight minutes. Next, I guess we go for door E? I guess we'll just do these in alphabetical order. I guess eventually you come to like learn this maze 
really well, sort of. But, it, I mean, you can still only know it so well. Even when I kind of know where I'm going, it's easy to kind of get lost, so I just need the blue, yep. And I think I need this blue right around the old corner. This is a nice case where the blue's right there. But, see, this is another case where it feels like kind of an underdeveloped mechanic. This, this is the one part of the game I've never fully liked, but it feels like it, it wants to be a puzzle, but it's really just trial and error. Like, there, there almost is no puzzle here. And I wish there was. I wish this was more of a puzzle. But, like, there's no way to, like, look at all these terminals and do something. You literally, it's just trial and error. It's just trial and error. And look at those stairs over there. Wouldn't you like to know what's down there? Um, well, we'll get to that eventually. But first, we got a bunch of random doors to open. It's funny, this feels so much more satisfying when you have a guide telling you exactly what to open. Doesn't this doesn't this building look super cool, though? Like a super rundown base? Like, the, the graphics in this game look visually awesome for, like, an 80s game. I just kind of wish they did more with this base, other than just a puzzle. Like, you could have some cool adventures with this tile set. And, by the way, here's a hidden room. Part of the hallway here crumbles away, revealing a secret passageway. What a what will we find? Oh my god, it looks like a crashed jet. Or could it be a mech? You have found the largest mech you've ever seen, a Phoenix Hawk Lamb. Just like the one your father piloted, the coincidence is too much to believe. Look at that glorious, glorious pixel art. That is awesome. That is totally awesome. Oh my god. Now, probably at this point, you think that maybe you actually get to pilot this awesome-looking badass mech, but you'd be mistaken. They basically just want you to look at it and be like, look how cool this looks. You scramble up the boarding ladder to inspect the mech. Sitting in the cockpit, you notice an empty socket. It's just the right size to fit the biochip that was your fa in your father's box with the holodisc. You plug in the chip and power up the mech. The mech springs to life, and the onboard computer recognizes the biochip. Um, it's almost, they're really tantalizingly teasing that you might be able to pilot this mech, but no, you will not be able to. By the way, I don't actually remember if I ever found this mech when I was a kid. Uh, in fact, if it was not for the sort of map that we were looking at, I would not have known this secret room even existed. Um, so I totally don't remember if I've ever seen this before in my life. But in a pleasant female voice, it greets uh, the pilot. Welcome aboard, Jeremiah. Shall we continue our mission? It is your father's mech. Since it is in the perfect condition, then he must have hidden it here. He must have known someone was after him and left the mech here so it wouldn't be captured. This brings new hope that maybe he isn't dead after all. I mean, it's kind of ambiguous as to whether he's dead or not. You dismount the mech to continue your mission of locating the cache and using the hyperpulse generator to contact Katrina. I would start piloting the mech if it were me. That's just me. When you find an awesome, cool mech, you don't just leave it. But uh, I guess we have better things to do. All right, one more. Yes. All right, we're getting there. We're almost there. I'm trying to remember as a kid, did I draw out a map using trial and error to try and figure out what all the door codes were and what all the terminals were? I can't remember, but it sounds like something I would have done eventually. I mean, we're, getting, we're, we're making good progress here. Obviously, I want this blue key code. Give me these key codes. Give me the codes. Give me the codes to open the goddamn door. Man, you 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 get the Starly Catch madness down here. Starly Cash. Sorry, not Catch. Cash. Oh damn, I've already used that one. Where's the last code that I need? Yes, give it to me. Now we get to go and open a cooler door somewhere around here. Look at okay, I'm not I'm not gonna edit this part out, but like look at how far we have to walk. This is literally insane. They I they they were getting real sadistic with this one. Again, keep in mind, I have I have a guide. I know exactly where I'm supposed to go. I'm I'm literally cheating. And if you didn't know the exact codes, you would have to go all the way, this whole path that I've been walking, trying all these different terminals, getting codes, and then walking all the way up here and trying it, seeing if, if it worked. If it didn't, going all the way back and getting different codes. That's sadistic. That's insane. Look, we're in a storeroom now. And hey, look, there is a ladder. 
Let's see what's going on down the ladder in Ladder World. You have found a ladder leading to a second level. Climbing down the ladder, you are shocked by what you see. This is a huge subterranean storeroom stocked with thousands of mech repair parts, tools, repair platforms, and several fully assembled mechs in spotless condition. See, it's here that I thought maybe there'd be a final climactic battle and you get to pilot some impressive mechs, which is what this game actually kind of needs. Gives you an eerie feeling looking at all these impressive machinery knowing that it has been dormant for hundreds of years. Congratulations, you have found the hidden Starly cache of mech repair parts. Your mission is nearly fulfilled. All you need to do now is contract Katrina on the Hyperpulse generator so that the Commonwealth can send in a military ex uh, escort to get you and the cache off the planet. Um, so yeah, you don't actually get to use the, the awesome Star League 100 year air, uh, dormant battle mechs. You just get to know they exist, which again is a little bit of a letdown. Would have been kind of cool if you got to do something with them. Hey, look, we open up another door and there's a whole bunch of computers here. Pretty sure that none of these are on. We have like one last door to open, which is to basically grant power. Uh, you have turned on the hyperpulse generator. Oh, okay. Uh, now what? Can I just straight up, like, send a message? Is that how this works? Uh, I'm pretty sure we have... There's one more room that we have to open up. I mean, there's there's still one more locked door. So, I mean, obviously, we have to do, like, a little bit more. But, okay, just a big empty old room here. No real purpose. <laughs> I mean, it looks cool. I'll give you that much. It looks neat. Okay, we need this one. Yellow 32... My God, this this it, uh, any any sort of Rain Man type gamer who was able to solve this on their own, kudos to them. I did solve this as a kid. Uh, I did I did not have a walkthrough, but it was again pure trial and error. I might have written stuff down. Uh, where's the last one that we need though? Okay, we need red thirty, green thirty two, and blue twenty three. Which means we got to go down here, around, up, over, down, through, here, over, here, that. And then we have to go back over this way, down this way, over this way, up here. Oh my god. Why would they do this? What were they trying to prove? What were they trying to prove? Who were they trying to impress? Why? Why? The thing is, like, it's not even, like, necessarily, like, fun to do this. I don't know, like, okay, am I wrong? Am I wrong here? Like, is is this, like, a fun, interesting puzzle? I just, I remember this, this section is sort of like a headache section. Like, it's it's not even that rewarding to do. <laughs> I'm using a, I'm using a manual. I'm not even that rewarded. Yes, blue 23. All right. Now we can finally get the hell out of here. This is what we've been waiting for. We've been going around from terminal to terminal doing all this this intricate puzzle. Thank God there wasn't a Curie to Force chasing us or something. We would have been screwed. It would have taken them months to open this up by themselves, but uh, they could have just like sent a team of scientists down here, tried every possible combination and made it work. Meanwhile, like if we were in any kind of rush, we would have been 100% screwed. Boom. All right, this is it. It's down to the power sector to turn on the hyperpulse generator. Yeah, you peer down the hole and see a huge map painted on the floor. You climb down the ladder and investigate it. Ba -ba -ba -ba! So here is a map of stars and you get to activate certain stars and you have to figure out some kind of pattern to uh, turn on the hyperpulse generator. So in order to help you figure out this pattern, um, you actually have um, a map that came with the instruction manual. And here's that map. I had this map as a kid. I made it to the map room and I literally spent weeks stuck in there. I thought maybe all the black uh, planets you had to uh, activate, that didn't work. I thought maybe all the planets with the square around them you have to activate, that didn't work. I thought the starred ones you had to activate, that didn't work. I tried just the ones in each sector separately. That didn't work. I tried all these things. It didn't work. You know what it is? It's so obviously stupid. You can probably see it on the map right now. You just have to activate the planets that are in this little path here, this little uh, shaded area. I didn't realize that for weeks. Talk about being a little dense. So we need Pesht, Benjamin, Sky, Ryerson, Cathal, 
and uh, Ash Ashernar. Ashernar. Let's start with Pesh, Benjamin, and Sky. So we'll start with Benjamin and Pesh here. Nope. Turn it on. Um, Luthien, by the way, is the capital of the Draconis Combine. So right now we're in Curie to Space. Uh, where is Sky? Sky is over here. Uh, Sky is one of the important worlds in the House Steiner. Rasat, Rasahugu up there. That is a, a capital of a splinter um, province that kind of splits off of uh, the Draconis Combine, becomes a buffer state between it and uh, House Steiner. Tharkad is the capital of House Steiner. Merakir, spell oddly, I believe. Oh no, Mer Merak and Merik. One of these, I think, is the capital of, uh, of House Merrick. There's Sarna, which uh, Sarna.net, the Battletech wiki that has all the great info, takes its name from Capella. I th Capella or Cyan is the capital of the Capella uh, Confederation, which is House Lyo. St. Ives is the capital of the Splinter province that comes off of the, the Capella Confederation. The New Avalon is the capital of the Federated Sons. Look at look at all this Battletech history that I'm just laying on you. Soul and Terra. Soul is our planet and Terra is Earth. So there you go. Um, anyway, we got the first three. Um, oops, Summer. Oh, nope. <laughs> okay, now what else do we need? Ryerson, Cathal, and Ashranar. By the way, I like how there's just a planet called uh, Jonathan. It's like, yeah, we named this one Jonathan. This one's named Barry. This one is uh, Joseph Sanderson. You know, it's just like just like standard dude names um, with like, you know, no other meaning other than that. Cathal and Arshanar. Boom. Is that it? Did we get them all? I think that's it. Pesh, Benjamin, Sky, Ryerson, Cathal, Arshanar. I can't think. Of, I don't see anything else. Oh, Summer. Summer. Summer is also in there. See that? See, I almost missed it. Okay, we need Summer as well. All right, where's Summer? Here's Summer right over here. Boom! Nothing happened. Okay, I'm, I'm just going to assume that that worked out. Jonathan, Castle, Ryerson, Arshanar. Okay, let's see what happens when we try to leave. Um, password accepted. White code installed. You can trigger the Hyperpulse generator now. Guys, we are in the final stages. You easily scaled the ladder back to the Starly Cache. Can you go back down there, by the way, just out of curiosity? You've already entered the white code. Yep, you cannot. So there you go. We've activated uh, the holographic code on, um, on uh, you know, the uh, 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 map of the universe and the planets and stuff. I'm like, I'm forgetting how to talk. We're, we're at the end of, man, we have played through Crescent Hawk's Inception. This is crazy. All right, here we go, guys. Are you ready? Are you ready for the big ending, the big the big pizzazz to like uh, uh, end this this whole thing? Okay, here we go. Uh, where where do we send our message? Is it here? You've turned on the power to the hyperpulse generator. Okay, is it here? No, oh, this that's just the power room. So the hyperpulse generator was over here, right? It was somewhere down this hall. Now that all the doors are unlocked, it's actually easy to walk around here. Um, here it is. Hyperpulse generator room. All right, where do we send a message? Where's the message sending computer? Uh, is it over here? Seriously, how do you send a message in this room? There's like computer terminals everywhere. There's one of these for... Wh where's the incoming and outgoing message section? Oh, there we go. Oh, we got, even get like a little animation. <laughs> you use the hyperpulse generator to send a signal to Katrina that you have found the cache. Confirmation of receiving your message comes across and you were told that a dropship is on its way to retrieve you and the parts. Oh, and here it comes. Oh, it just it's like a UFO just appearing randomly out of orbit. Uh, the dropship arrives and lands just west of the cache entry. Its tremendous firepower will hold off the Curitan occupational forces long enough for the equipment to be loaded. You stand and watch the work mix loading equipment and you feel a bit depressed i think that's like a theme for this game my guy has been considerably depressed um as we've gone on the planet you call home has been overtaken your father is gone all you know is been turned upside down what will you do now one of the messengers comes to you and tells you that there's an incoming message for you from katrina you rush to one of the hollow emitters in the dropship to hear what the archon has to say hey there she is and she's animated 
Jason, we're also very proud of you uh, for the way you have fulfilled this mission. You've achieved more than we had a right to hope for. In appreciation of your service, I would like to extend the opportunity to serve as a member of the Lyran Commonwealth Armed Forces. <laughs> I'd like to offer you the opportunity to join the army. That does not seem like a reward. If you accept, you'll be commissioned as a lieutenant. You stumble over the words uh, in your hurry to express your gratitude for such a generous offer. You end up looking as nervous as you feel and are somewhat embarrassed for it. Eventually, you manage to tell her that you must decline her offer. He looks super happy. That's his decline face? She clearly was not expecting you to say that. Neither was I. And asked for your reasons. You explain that since you signaled for the dropship to come and... You and Rex have been talking quite a bit about Jeremiah. You tell Katrina that you have come to the decision that he may not be dead after all. She's interested in this and asks for further details. You tell her what he said in the holodisc about a vendetta against the Kellhounds, of which Jeremiah was a member. Um, Rex, who was also a Kellhound, suspects that Curita Code of Honor and Ritual might encourage the Draconians to capture Kellhounds and hold a trial, rather than assassinating the members individually. Katrina is not necessarily convinced that you are right, but she's impressed enough to give you a chance to find out. She declares that you, Rex, and the rest can operate as an independent unit to be known as the Crescent Hawks, which is what we're also, we were already known by that, but sure. Um, and she wishes you the very best. I hope you find him alive, Jason. I really do. With that, she terminates the communication and your, uh, you order the rest of the new Crescent Hawks to board the dropship to begin the search and go on to uh, greater glory. With that, oh, and, and there we go. The end. Press any key to end the game. We did it! Success! We are the Crescent Hawks masters. We did it uh, with grit and determination, guy. We saw everything this game had to offer. I can't think of a single thing we skipped. And uh, what did we learn today? I think we learned that battle mechs are awesome, that Battletech is like Game of Thrones in space, and that if you are unfamiliar with Battletech, you need to get familiar with Battletech, because you just watched a four-part Let's Play of Battletech. And uh, yeah, so this story was carried forward in the Crescent Hawks Revenge. Again, there if, if you're curious, there's a full playthrough of that you can find on my channel, or other people have done playthroughs. If you're getting sick of me, you can uh, find those. Um, but of course, Jason does go on to search for his father. It's kind of interesting, like this the the way this game ends. Reading it now makes me think that maybe they were thinking of a second RPG where you'd like infiltrate a curated world, and there'd be like a trial and stuff, and you know you try and uh, try and like rescue your father. And so you, you I could have seen this going in the RPG direction. Ultimately, of course, they went for a tactical, uh, almost like a real time strategy game. Um, kind of like a turn-based, real-time tactical game, if that makes sense. Uh, which is different, but, you know, Battletech Crescent Hawks Revenge is its own form of greatness. So, very different games, but very cool in their own way. Um, I think we also learned that uh, I'm, I'm boss at playing the stock market, and I don't know why I'm not personally invested in the real market. I mean, I guess if, if the stock market was as easy to get as rich as we did in this game... As, uh, as it is, if it was that easy in real life, then we'd all be millionaires, but that ain't happening anytime soon. Guys, I've had a lot of fun with this game. Did you guys grow up playing this game or was this a new experience for you? Um, and if it was a new experience, what was your fun, your fondest memory of our little let's play here over the last few weeks? You know, what was the most fun, uh, you saw in this game? Uh, what did you like about this game? You know, just do you want to talk about Battletech? Feel free to feel free to like sound off in the comments on any of these topics. Um, anything Battletech related or Crescent Hawks related would be awesome. Um, as always, I hope you've enjoyed these videos. If you have, it really helps me out if you like the video and subscribe. And, you know, if you want to check me out on Patreon or something like that, you know, I'm not opposed to it. Uh, but I don't tend to try and push those things on people. I just want people to enjoy my videos. So if you're still listening to this then I give you a, 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 an awesome thumbs up. Um, beyond that, um, you guys all take care of yourselves. I will be back soon with uh, more video games. So, um, you know, my channel, we're constantly playing new games. So, hey, it will be something new for you guys to watch any day now. Until next time, my friends, as they say in the Battletech universe, no guts, no galaxy. And it's been a blast visiting this Battletech classic with you guys. Until next time, my friends, take care of yourselves. Peace. Seriously, what the f***?
Why? Why is this part so terrible? Who hurt the developers? Who made them do this to us? Why?